will. Um, in that first session today, rather than the two plant speakers, we'll have three speakers. Um, each of them will be allotted of half hour, and we'll have very minimal time for questions. Um, in between, please save your questions. Um, on the Most of the questions will have to be asked and answered during free time. Um, our first speaker is Professor Paul M. Rouleau, of the of the Professor of Assyriology at the University of Toronto and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He has published ex extensively on history, culture, religion of Babylonia during the first millennium BCE. And from, for me, he has um, given me fresh and new perspectives on the astronomical traditions from this period and helped me understand some of the culture of the Jewish experience in Babylonia at this time. His current research projects include late Babylonian archives from Ur and Uruk and the history of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Well, first I want to thank you for the invitation to participate in this conference. The subject of literature is a very important one, indeed a very intriguing one, when we consider the distinctiveness of ancient scribal cultures. Literature, in our understanding, implies authorship and readership, or, more broadly, a text and its audience, and media such as books to facilitate its diffusion. When it comes to Mesopotamian literature, such questions are difficult to study because of the limited amount of evidence at our disposal. Nevertheless, try we must, and today I will discuss some aspects of the reception and influence of the Babylonian epic of creation in the ancient world, known in Mesopotamia as Enuma Elish. Although it may seem quaint to modern readers and sometimes labored as a work of literature, Enuma Elish was truly an innovative text. It is the earliest comprehensive account of the origins of the world in Mesopotamia, from primeval chaos to the creation of humanity. It is the first text that ascribes these accomplishments to the will of a single god, thus providing a framework for later monotheistic speculations. It is also a highly political text, assigning a privileged place to the city of Babylon in the mundane and transcendental orders. As soon as it was composed and began to circulate at the end of the second millennium, it became a rallying point for the theologians of Babylon. They maintained and even amplified its claims in hymns, prayers, and various scholarly compilations. But Enuma Elish also put on the defensive Babylon's neighbors, who lacked such a sweeping narrative, placing their own god and city at the center of the world. They met the challenge with various textual strategies, mostly in the form of borrowing and co-optation, a practice that is now condemned as cultural appropriation. <laughs> so the best known examples come from Assyria and were introduced probably by Sennacherib after his destruction of Babylon in 689, though they may have earlier roots. These include the Assyrian recension of the Enuma Elish, which replaces Marduk with the Assyrian god Ashur, Anshar, and Babylon with the city of Assur, and the so-called Marduk ordeal, which claims to quote Enuma Elish, but in fact turns it on its head. Sennacherib's efforts were in vain, as we know. At the end of the seventh century, the Assyrian Empire collapsed and was replaced with a new one centered on Babylon. In a sense, the Neo-Babylonian Empire of the sixth century was the political fulfillment of the theological claims laid in Enuma Elish, namely that Babylon really was the center of the world. Therefore, we should expect the epic to have reached the apex of its influence during and after the brief period of Babylon's hegemony. Yet, the subject has not been investigated very much. So I will begin with the royal inscriptions of Nabopolassar, the founder of the Neo-Babylonian state. They contain several allusions to Enuma Elish. For example, one of the 50 names of Marduk in the epic is Shazu, 
literally the one who knows the heart, which is explained as follows. This is in Umayyish 7.35. Shazu mudeli bi'ili sha ibaru kakshu. Shazu, who knows the heart of the gods, the one who inspects inner thoughts. In two of his inscriptions, Nabopolassar addresses Marduk with that very same name. So this is, you know, well, I'm giving you the reference <laughs> with the Rossio's edition. Shazu belumu de libi ili shashame u erziti, shatakalat nishi ibaru kayani. Shazu, the Lord who knows the heart of the gods of heaven and the netherworld, who inspects the inner thoughts of the people steadfastly. This passage is evidently inspired by the explanation of the name Shazu in Inuma Elish, but it does not repeat it verbatim. Rather, it paraphrases Inuma Elish using similar vocabulary and one rare synonym highlighted in blue on the slide. The rare synonym is Takaltu, pouch, stomach, a divinatory term used here as a gloss to Karshu. The word takaltu is not otherwise attested in a figurative sense to mean inner thoughts. Therefore, the inscription is innovative, and the passage, which looks like a learned commentary on Enuma Elish, evidently stems from the scholarly elite in the service of the king. Let us consider another example. In his inscription recording the restoration of the Etemenanki in Babylon, Nabopolassar refers to the ziggurat as follows. Bitu mechet ishara ina ulti u rishati lu e pushma kimashadi rishishu lu uli. This temple, the replica of Eshara, I truly built amidst joy and gladness and raised its top like a mountain. While the very same expression, replica of Eshara, occurs in Inumailish in reference to the building of Babylon in primeval time. So this is Inumailish 5. Elenu apsi shubat hashmani mechet ishara sha'abnu anaku elkun. Above the apsu, the blue-green colored dwelling, is the replica of ishara that I built for you. There is no doubt that, Nabopolassar, that the Nabopolassar inscription is quoting Inumailish here since the expression mechet ishara occurs only in these two sources. Inuma Elish not only claims that the ziggurat Etemenanki is a replica of ishara, um, it also claims that the Esagil temple is the replica of Apsu, this is in tablet 662, and that ishara itself is a replica of Apsu, so this is in tablet 4142. Thus, Inuma Elish proposes a tripartite cosmology, Babylon and the temple complex of the god Marduk stand in the middle. Below there is Apsu, the subterranean waters that are the domain of the god Ea. And above is Ashara, the main level of heaven where the god Enlil resides. So Nabopolassar was succeeded by his son Nebuchadnezzar II, who also often refers to the building of Babylon right above the Apsu. For example, he uses this motif in his cylinder reporting on the building of fortifications between the Euphrates and the gate of Ishtar. Ishissa mechat apsi ina shupul me berutim usharshid rishishu shadanish uzakir. I secured its foundation directly on the apsu, on distant waters far below, and raised its top as high as a mountain. Another recurrent reference to large bodies of water in the inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar is the transformation of the area north of Babylon into a mighty sea for defensive purposes. His stone tablet inscription contains an interesting amplification of this motif. So this is the translation only. So that no merciless enemy can come close to the outskirts of Babylon I had the land surrounded with a huge expanse of water, like a mighty sea, merabiutim kimagipish tiamati, so that crossing them was like crossing the roiling sea, a bitter body of water, kima eber tiamti galati yarimarti. 
The sea described here is a threatening and stormy body of salt water, thus much closer to the Tiamat of Inuma Elish than do the canals and moats surrounding Babylon. Other inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar describe the extension of this mighty sea all the way to Sippar and the transformation of Babylon into a fortress and even a mountain, a life-preserving refuge for the people. So Inuma Elish claims that Babylon was built over the Apsu. This is a direct claim. The Apsu is the vanquished body of primeval waters where the god Ea, the father of Marduk, established his seat at the beginning of the epic. Apsu and Tiamat are, of course, the two bodies of primeval water in the epic, and the defeat of Apsu at the beginning of the narrative prefigures the defeat of Tiamat in its later portions. After his victory, Marduk split her body into two halves. He stretched one half to create the celestial vault, while the other became the earth with its rivers and underground springs. Indeed, Inuma Elish, in Tablet 555, claims that Marduk let the Tigris and Euphrates flow from her two eyes. A Neo-Assyrian commentary is even more specific, claiming that the two rivers came from the right and left eye of Tiamat. Therefore, Babylon was built not only above the waters of Apsu, but also above the waters of Tiamat. In fact, the notion that Babylon was built over Tiamat is clearly stated in the second tablet of the topographical series Tintir equals Babylu, which begins with the following statement. Tiamat, Shubat Bel, Shabel Inamuchi Ashbu. Tiamat is the seat of the god Bel, Marduk, where the god Bel resides. Thus, if Apsu was the residence of the god Ea, <coughs> Tiamat was the seat of Marduk. In view of this, it seems probable that the references to the sea and even the mighty sea or the rolling sea surrounding Babylon in the inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar are not only to the actual dikes, moats, and levees that barred the approach to the city. They also allude to the cosmological notion that the city was actually built over the slain body of Tiamat as a residence for the god Marduk. The reference to Inuma Elish is clear. And this was not only a literary motif, it was a belief, you know, a fact. As we just saw, Nebuchadnezzar refers to these expanses of water as the great waters, me rabiotin. I would argue that this is the origin of the biblical epithet of Babylon as seated on great waters, which appears in the oracle against Babylon in Jeremiah 51. So verse 13, you Babylon, who dwell on great waters, Mayim Rabim, abundant in treasures, your end has come, the measure of your greed. The trope resurfaced centuries later in the book of Revelation, where the harlot symbolizing Babylon is said to sit by many waters. The expression Mayim Rabim sometimes carries a cosmological meaning in biblical Hebrew referring to the subterranean ocean. Yet, commentators routinely argue that this is not the case in Jeremiah 51. The expression would refer only to the fact that the Euphrates and its canals form the conspicuous part of the physical landscape surrounding Babylon. However, given the contemporaneity of Jeremiah 51 with the Babylonian Empire and the exile, it seems probable that the image was borrowed from the inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar and with similar cosmological implications. It may even imply actual knowledge of the contents of Enuma Elish on the part of the author of Jeremiah 51, which is of course separate from the rest of the book, you know, 5051 or you know, a separate uh, tradition. So the trope lived on, the idea that Babylon was built on the primeval waters of the vanquished sea resurfaces in a fragment of the late antique writer Abidinus. The fragment is preserved 
in the Preparatio Evangelica by Eusebius. So this is the broker's uh, translation. And about the foundation of Babylon by Nebuchadnezzaros, the same, Abidinus, writes this. They, the Babylonians, say that everything originally was water and was called Thalassa. Belos restrained it, assigning a place to each thing. And he surrounded Babylon with a wall. But with the passage of time, it disappeared. And Nebuchadnezzar again built a wall with bronze gates, which lasted until the Macedonian domination. Abidinus might be quoting from Berossus, but this is far from certain. Be that as it may, this fragment is remarkable in its adherence to Enuma Elish and to the claims of Nebuchadnezzar's inscriptions. The god Marduk ordered the construction of Babylon over the vanquished sea, and later on, Nebuchadnezzar renewed his deed by rebuilding Babylon as a walled fortress rising above the sea. The fragment also displays an adaptation of Babylonian tradition to Greek cosmological speculations. Tiamat has become Thalassa, the Greek word for sea, and the waters of the primeval chaos have been demythologized by the claim that originally everything was water. The idea that water was the sole original element was attributed in antiquity to the first pre-Socratic philosopher, Thales of Miletus, who also claimed that the earth actually floated on water. However, Thales was a contemporary of Nebuchadnezzar, and ancient doxography insists on his Phoenician ancestry and his knowledge of Egyptian wisdom. The idea that water was the primeval element is not particularly original. It can be found in the mythologies of several cultures. At the same time, I would you know, seriously consider the possibility that Thales, who was probably aware of Babylonian cosmological speculations, was encouraged in his claims by the knowledge that Enuma Elish also considered water to stand at the origin of the world. Let us not forget that in the lifetime of Thales, Enuma Elish was the official creation of health of the dominant power in that part of the world. So Nebuchadnezzar had a troubled succession, resulting in the accession of Nabonidus six years later. Nabonidus was not a passionate devotee of Marduk. However, there are at least two instances where he alludes to Enuma Elish in his inscriptions. The inscriptions in question were composed late in his reign, when his devotion to the moon god Sin showed no restraint. The first case occurs in the inscription for the restoration of the ziggurat in Ur, the Elugal Galgasisa. In the concluding prayer, Nabonidus addresses Sin with the unusual, indeed with a unique epithet, gods of gods. Sin bel ili, sha ili, sha shame u erciti, ilu sha ili. O Sin, Lord of the gods, King of the gods of heaven and the netherworld, gods of gods. The epithet, King of the gods of heaven and the netherworld, is a translation of Marduk's name, Lugal Dimer Ankia, one of his most prominent names in Inuma Elish. As for the epithet, gods of gods, it, is very it very probably refers to the passage of Enuma Elish, where the gods prepare to proclaim the 50 names of Marduk. Luzizama tsalmat kakadi ilani, nashi mala shuma nimbu shulu ilni, inimbema rasha shumeshu. Although humanity is divided as to the gods they worship, for us, the gods, whatever divine name we invoke, he is indeed our god, Marduk. Let us pronounce his 50 names. This is the clearest statement that of the superior status of Marduk and can be viewed almost as a monotheistic creed. It seems very likely that Nabonidus is alluding to this passage of Enuma Elish when he praises the god Sin as the gods 
plural, of all the other gods. By doing so, he is usurping the exalted status of Marduk in favor of Sin and challenging the claims of Enuma Elish. But raising the profile of a god requires not only political power and support among the clergy, which he didn't have, <laughs> it also involves publicity. It's all about publicity. So. <laughs> um, the deeds of the god need to be proclaimed, and this is, in fact, one of the many innovative aspects of the Enuma Elish. Unusual for cuneiform literature, the epic concludes with a call for its own dissemination among future generations. So, taklimti machu idbubu panushu ishtur ma ishtakan anashime akuti. This is at the very end of the epic. The teaching which a prominent one had recited before him, before Marduk, he, the author, wrote and established it for the instruction of future generations. This claim, while singular, makes a lot of sense if we consider the purpose of Enuma Elish. It is the proclamation of a new theology, the announcement to humankind of the victory of Marduk over the forces of chaos in primeval time and his organization and rule of an ordered world. Although we usually think of Enuma Elish as an epic, a myth, or even a poem, it is also a gospel. It's an evangelion, the good news of the revelation of a new faith and the miraculous deeds of its God. So the expression for the instruction of future generations, Anasheme Akuti, is extremely rare. Outside Enuma Elish, it occurs only in the hymn of Ashurbanipal to the god Ashur, and most prominently in monuments that Nabonidus erected late in his reign, containing new editions of four building inscriptions. He describes these inscriptions as follows. Epishtisin bel ili uishtarati ashibuti shashame uerziti, sha inamuri asumineti shagalali ashturuma anashime shanishi arkuti. Such is the deed of the god seen the Lord of gods and goddesses who dwell in heaven and the netherworld, which I wrote on stone monuments for the instruction of future generations. The phrase used by Nebuchadnezzar is identical with Enuma Elish, Anasheme Arkuti Shataru, to write for the instruction of future generations. The fact that it occurs only in these two contexts almost certainly assures that Nebuchadnezzar is paraphrasing and co-opting Enuma Elish to undermine its theological claims in the same manner as Sennacherib had done in the previous century. As we know, the efforts of Nabonidus came to naught with the conquest of Babylon by the Persians. The Cyrus Cylinder spares no rhetorical effort to vilify Nabonidus and stress his neglect of the god Marduk. As uh, Hans-Peter Schaudich has pointed out recently, the cylinder also contains allusions to Enuma Elish. The most obvious are the following. In Enuma Elish, Marduk is praised under his first name as follows. Marduk sha ilani abishu itiru ina shapshaki. Marduk who saved the gods, his fathers, from hardship. The hardship is, of course, Tiamat, and her monstrous rebellion. The Sarah Cylinder borrows the same imagery. Marduk al shu Babilu itir ina shapshaki. Marduk saved his city, Babylon, from hardship. Here, the hardship is no longer Tiamat, but Nabonidus. And if the savior is Marduk, the agent of the salvation is, of course, Cyrus. In another passage of Enuma Elish, the gods address Marduk as follows. Ata luzaninu parakini. O Marduk, may you be the provisioner of our shrines. In the Cyrus Cylinder, the gods of Babylonia now praise Cyrus and his son Cambyses with the very same words. Shunu luzaninu parakini. May they, Cyrus and Cambyses, be the provisioners of our shrines. 
During that period, we also find echoes of Enuma Elish in the Bible. These have long been the subject of discussion, if not controversy. Despite some repeated protestations to the contrary, it seems probable that the priestly account of creation at the beginning of the book of Genesis was, to a significant degree, an appropriation of Enuma Elish, one that is comparable to the previous efforts of Sennacherib and Nabonidus to co-opt the Marduk theology in favor of other gods. It has also been pointed out several times, I think it was first by Tzimern, <laughs> uh, that the account of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 bears striking similarities to the building of Babylon in its ziggurat in Enuma Elish. But here we encounter some problems with the dating of the J source, a very contentious issue which I will not discuss. <laughs> so uh, so in, in this passage, Marduk is speaking to the gods Build Babylon, the task you requested. Let its brickwork be formed, raise the shrine high. The Anunnaki gods struck the hoe. For one year, they made its brickwork. When the second year arrived, they raised the head of Isagil, the counterpart of Apsu. They built the lofty ziggurat of Apsu. So the dispersion of the, of the people of Babel by God in Genesis 11, uh, yes, in Genesis 11, and the subsequent interruption of the building of the city may well be viewed uh, as a jibe at Enuma Elish, a pastiche aiming to undermine the pretensions of Babylon to cosmological and, of course, political centrality. So I must now conclude this vastly incomplete survey. There are many more examples. You see the similar to those I pointed out. The reception of Inuma Elish wavered between two attitudes, reassertion and amplification on one side, and a mixture of rejection and co-optation on the other side. It is evident that the text had a significant impact in Mesopotamia and even beyond, but not specifically for its intrinsic literary qualities. In fact, exact quotations of verses from Inuma Elish are few and mostly limited to school texts and commentaries. On the other hand, we can identify numerous paraphrases of the epic, not to mention allusions to its theological and cosmological ideas. Inuma Elish was known in detail only to a restricted number of Mesopotamian priests and scribes. However, the storyline of the epic and its broad ideas may have circulated widely by word of mouth without always reflecting its content accurately. And accuracy, uh, accuracy was not necessarily the preserve of Babylonian scholars. After all, the Neoplatonist philosopher Damascus, who lived in the fifth and sixth centuries of our era, quotes in his works a nearly accurate list of the primeval deities at the beginning of Enuma Elish. He was probably relying on the works of an earlier Greek writer, perhaps Eudemus, a pupil of Aristotle and a contemporary of Alexander the Great. Obviously, Eudemus had access to reliable Babylonian source or informants. By contrast, Berossus, a Babylonian priest who was partly contemporary with Eudemus, offers in his Babyloniaca a pastiche of the account of creation, which is only loosely based on Enuma Elish. It is unlikely to stem from an alternative written cuneiform version for which there is no evidence. The sources of Berossus are more, are more likely stories that were circulating among Babylonians at that time. A reminder that in discussing Mesopotamian literature, we should you know, keep in mind that the official cuneiform text, the only source that has survived, was not the only channel for its diffusion. So thank you. Thank you. We have no time for questions. We have time, I think, for two questions. Going once. Yes. Yeah. It's a rare term in Akkadian, as far as I can see. It's very rare, yeah. Is it that automatic to the typical Hebrew for Nile, 
who knows? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, you know, I, it's, I haven't explored this avenue, <laughs> this avenue, but yeah, it, mean, it means a salt pond, but, but it's referring to obviously an ocean. So. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, you very, very much for a very interesting paper. <laughs>